Welcome to the Portsmouth Historical Society Museum. Today we're doing a living history presentation where you can come in and meet various citizens of Portsmouth's past. We have George Manchester upstairs in the church. We have Emmeline Eldridge who speaks about Sarah Eddy. We have James Preston, our first schoolmaster in the school. And we have Jerry Kamara in the Old Town Hall, a former resident of Glen Farm. She'll tell you all about farming in Portsmouth. Welcome, I'm Kathy. Welcome to the History Comes Alive at the Portsmouth Historical Society. We're gonna climb the steps of the Christian Union Church, which was built in 1865 we're going to go up to what was called the audience room. That is where the worship services took place. Downstairs housed areas where they had social meetings, they had, um, me they had uh, meetings, they had a lending library and a kitchen. So it was both social and religious. This is the second church on the same spot, okay? The, uh, the, the Christian church was uh, non-denominational. It was Christian in that they did believe that the Bible is the word of God, but they were pretty um, open as to you know, uh, inviting people to come and preach from various Christian religions. The congregation thrived for 50 years and um, started to dwindle after World War I. The last service was held in 1937 and three years later, in 1940, the remaining 14 members voted to turn the property over to the Portsmouth Historical Society. So we were fortunate enough to get this building for our museum. So this, this was a church until 1940? This was, um, it was a church until 1937 was their last yeah. service, and then in 1940, they officially oh. turned it over. So today, we're gonna, we're, so we're gonna go upstairs. You're going to, we're going to hear from George Manchester. He lived down on Glen Road, and he was a very important figure in the Portsmouth community during the 1860s, 1870s. For many years, he served as clerk of this church. Mr. Manchester, we have a group here for you. Hey, come in, come in. Right up front. Feel free to say anything you wish. So, my name is George Manchester. And I live just a bit east of here on Glen Road. I'm a jack of all trades, as the expression goes, but primarily, I guess, I'm, I'm a carpenter, and I've helped build many buildings here in, in Portsmouth. I take pride in our community, so I've served uh, in many positions, superintendent of schools, high sheriff of Newport County, as well as several sessions as state representative. But the position that I hold most dear is that of clerk of this church, the Christian Union Church. Now we were founded back in 1810. The, the basic principle was that the Bible is the word of God and if you believe that, then you are welcome to come. We met in private homes until 1824 when a small meeting house was built right on the site of this church. William Ellery Channing, the well-known Unitarian minister, spent his summers here in Portsmouth, and he loved to come on Sunday afternoons to talk with the members. Well, by 1865, we, we didn't all fit in the small church, so uh, we decided to build this structure. It cost a whopping $7,000, but we all pitched in, and within five months, it was completed. Well, we did have to add the choir loft up there uh, just a bit later. Our pastor at the time, William E. Miller, supervised the construction, and he built the pulpit. I think that's appropriate, because after all, <laughs> that's where he was going to be. Well, we were not your typical church. We invited women to speak. Women. Our neighbor, Julia Ward Howe, perhaps you've heard of her, over on Union Street, she would sometimes come on Sundays to supply the pulpit. We also employed female co-pastors, especially when we were evangelizing. And uh, now more recently, 
in the uh, uh, 1870s where we are now, the pastors are holding open meetings at the Glen where other Methodist pastors and ministers of other denominations would be present. Always we focused on those things that hold us together as Christians, never on any doctrine that might separate us. Well, the activities of the church centered upon the work of the various committees. Our busiest committee, music and social life. Our members believe that everyone should have access to a musical education. So we had a singing school here, organ lessons were given. We, we have several organs here. The work of the social group would coordinate uh, turkey suppers and Christmas festivals right here in the church, as well as uh, uh, clam bakes, strawberry festivals, and oyster suppers in the Glen and other places on the island. Our Sunday School and Religious Culture Committee would make sure that we had a guest minister whenever we didn't have a regular pastor. We couldn't pay much, so many is the time that, that someone had to step up to fill the pulpit just so that we could have a Sunday service. Dorothea Dix, the famed reformer, founded our Sunday school. The essence of Christian charity, that was expressed by the work of the Service to the Sick and Benevolent Works Committee. Now these fine souls would visit our sick members, would uh, consider applications for uh, charity and aid mission, and would bring cases of need to the attention of the church board. We have an excellent library here. You're welcome to, to borrow a book and to return it when you're finished. We like to promote general knowledge. So our library and, and uh, intellectual culture committee sponsors uh, lectures, essays, and discussions. And finally, our finance committee. Well, we need them just so that we're going to stay solvent and to keep our records. Well, there it is. You are most welcome to return on Sundays for worship. And attend the class. Yes. Welcome. Thank you. Come on in. Yeah. Well, now, please come in. Now, we must separate you, boys on the left and girls on the right. We can't have you mixing together. Boys on the left, girls on the right. Uh, girls on the right, yes, yes, yes. Yes, find a seat. Yes, you're, you're a little bigger than most of my students, but hopefully you'll fit. Yes, <laughs> boys on the left, girls on the right. All right. Well, welcome back to class. Now, as you know, I'm, I'm James Preston, and I am really grateful to the town of Portsmouth and your parents for really valuing education to the town for building this wonderful schoolhouse and to your parents for paying my salary and for some of them, letting my family and I live in their homes. So now we've spent many months learning how to read, write, and do arithmetic. And I'm really pleased with your progress. Now, this is the last day of class for a while because it's harvest time. And you're going to help your parents take in the harvest. So I probably won't see you for several weeks and maybe even a month. But I thought we'd try to have our, one of our final classes. Now, as you know, we start each class with scripture. Today, I've chosen a reading from Proverbs. It's chapter 19, verse 20. Listen to advice and accept instruction that you may gain wisdom in the future. So even God wants you to have a good education. Now, on the first day you came, I told you about the rules. And I'm really pleased that for the most part, you follow the rules. As you know, they're posted over here. And if you break the rules, you can get lashes. And uh, for the most part, you were very good. I didn't have to wrap you on the palm with my switch or on the knuckles because it can hurt. And I really don't want to do that. Uh, fortunately, 
none, none of the boys these past few months misbehaved to the girls, and I didn't have to give anyone ten lashes. So that was good. There, there was a day, however, when, when some boy, maybe it was you, I don't remember, might, might have been you, uh, c climbed a tree up to about seven feet, and, and I had to give you four lashes. Uh, now, you, you, you may not believe me, but that hurt me as much as it hurt you. Yes, it did. I'm, I, I'm sorry I had to do that, but we have to follow the rules. In general, you did follow the rules, and I'm very happy with you for that. Now, uh, we've learned how to do very well in reading. Uh, the, the horn books were, were helpful for reading and writing, right? When you have the uppercase on one side and the lowercase letters on the other side. There's a few of them around here, just, just to remind you what they're like. And, and I'm really happy that most of you can read. You, you were, the older ones were helping the younger ones in class and, and that you practiced at home with your brothers and sisters and your parents. And, and, and have really done very well. You also have done well in, in arithmetic. Many of you know your pounds, shillings, and pence, so that you should be able to go somewhere and buy something and understand what you're doing. And so I'm really happy that you've done that practice reading. Now, I think I would like to, sh that, that you can all show us how well you read. Now, I have a few of our primers on the desk there, if you have one nearby. Uh, you can take one, and uh, I, I think there's one there, yes, and, and, and yeah. why don't you, if you open it up, you'll see that you know, next to each letter is a little symbol and, and a verse, and so I'd like you to illustrate how well you read. Perhaps you could read uh, the one for the E. You see that there? It, 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 yes. Yeah, it should be there. Yeah, 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 yeah okay, no, yeah, yeah, okay. No, that should be right. You got it. That's got it. Right. Hmm. Yes. An eagle of flight is out of sight. Excellent, excellent. Now, now you've got one over there. Uh, how about the J for you? Yes. Job feels the rod and blesses God. Uh, very good. It, it, his name was actually Job, but that's close. <laughs> that's just knowing how the Bible, what the words are and the names are in the Bible. Let's see. You, you have one there. Let's see. Uh, how about the W for you? Yes. Next, last page, maybe. Whales in the sea, God's voice obey. Yes. Doesn't quite rhyme, but it's no, close. No. <laughs> but it, it's a good example of how well you've learned how to read these past few months. And I know that you will continue. Anyone else have one? Or oh, well, that's close enough. Yes. And, and so what I thought we'd do today as well as to illustrate how well you're doing, I want to give you a spelling test. We're going to give you some common words, and you're going to take your slate and your chalk, and if you if you have a uh, this is it right there, if you have a small one, you'll have to write small, because uh, I'll give you five words, and then you can uh, you know spell them out on your slate, and then we'll tell you whether you're doing okay. So yes, why don't you start? Yes. Okay, the first word is farthings, farthings. There are four farthings in a pence. <laughs> write it, write it. It's a test. We'll see how you do. If you do well, I have a treat for you. <laughs> so farthings was the word. Okay. And, and the next word, yes? The next word is apothecary. I feel sick. I will get some medication at the apothecary. <laughs> okay. I hope you're not feeling sick. I am. But <laughs> okay. And, and the next word? The third word is Cooper. I need a new barrel. I will visit the Cooper. Very good. Okay. Got that one? Okay. Fourth word. Wheel right. My wagon wheel broke. I need to see a wheel right. That's a tricky one. Be careful. <laughs> okay. The last word? The last word is peruker. 
My aunt needs a new wig. She must see the peruker. Peruker. <laughs> Very common word, used every day, right? <laughs> All right, are we all done? And then we'll tell you how this spells. So, you can correct your own slate. Yes, okay. Everyone done? Okay, farthings. F-A-R-T-H-I-N-G-S. You got it. Hey, you got it. You got it. <laughs> okay, how about the apothecary? A-P-O-T-H-E-C-A-R-Y. <laughs> I don't know what that is. And <laughs> uh, Cooper, he's, he's the barrel maker. C O O P E R. Two O's. Okay. Next one. Wheelwright. I said this was tricky. Wheelwright. W H E E L W R I G H T. Some people forget that second W. You got it right. Okay. And, and the last word was peruker. He's the wig maker. P E R U K E R. No good? Oh. Maybe you don't need a wig. So that's okay. Hairdresser. I don't know. How do you dress hair? I don't know how to do that. <laughs> do you put clothing on hair? Maybe. I, I've never heard of that. Well, I, I, I see. Uh, how, how, in, in general, did you do okay? I mean, you know, yeah, so, okay, you know, you got some of them right. Well, that's good. We're, we'll learn more words when you come back in a, in a few weeks. So, in any case, I, as I say, I'm really happy with your progress, and I'm looking forward to you coming back. And as a reward for doing so well in school, I have a treat for you. A friend of mine went to Boston last week, and he brought back this new candy, which is becoming very popular. It's called licorice. So if you'd like, as you leave, you can take a piece of licorice. I find it sticks to my teeth a little bit, but maybe that's okay. In any case, you can have a piece if you wish, or, or not. But in any case, I will see you in a few weeks after the harvest, and we can continue learning our, our, uh, to write, to read, and to do our arithmetic. Well, thank you for coming today. Well, I was born and raised on Glen Farm across the street, and the farm was owned by the Taylor family. And back then, gentleman farming was all the rage. And I know you've been to Bellevue Avenue in Newport, and you've seen all the Newport mansions. Well, imagine all the gentlemen who owned those mansions owned farms here in Portsmouth. And the big fun was to come, who had the biggest apple orchard, who had the, the best horses, who had uh, the highest butter fat content in your cow's milk. So they're all in competition with each other over the, the agricultural uh, details on their farm. So they were also very proud of that. And um, what you could see is some of the ribbons in this case here show um, some of the horses that won. And then there's even a cow there named Missy that I'll um, t talk to you about right now. Um, Mr. Taylor on his Glen farm had a cow named Missy and he boasted that she had the highest butter fat content in all of Portsmouth. So you can imagine all the other gentlemen farmer goes, oh no, you can't make those kinds of claims. So Mr. Taylor goes, oh yeah, you're doubting me? I'll take my case to court. So of course he goes to court and he goes um, all the way up to the Supreme Court and the Rhode Island State Department of Agriculture um, sent um, uh, administrators here to test Missy's milk for a year against other farmers' milks. Sure enough, Missy had the highest butter fat content in all of Portsmouth, so he did not put, uh, she did not put Mr. Taylor to shame on that one. So you can imagine back then growing up on the farm, it was a lot of fun, a lot of hard work, but definitely a lot of fun. Um, but Portsmouth has always been a farming community. Uh, from the beginning of the original settlements, of course, they started farming here for food and uh, raising their cattle and um, having gardens and things like that. And a lot of the first settlers were giving two acre house lots, mostly near some of the springs. So they would have plenty of water to um, grow their farms and to water their horses and cattle and other kinds of animals as well. And the first settlers um, also uh, not only shared the land, but they would divide it up um, into certain pastures. So they'd have sheep on one pasture, cows on another. And if you walk along uh, Portsmouth these days, you'll see even along here, the stone 
fence, the, the stone walls. And that was used to divide most of these um, farms and these animals out. Now, has anybody ever visited Common Fence Point on the northern um, end of Portsmouth? The, how it got that name was, that was uh, a big fence at the, um, just at the entrance of it, and everyone would bring their cows and their cattle there, and they would um, all um, go with it to, to graze, but it was the common area for them. So if you can imagine when you drive around there, all the animals that used to um, graze and frolic over there. But um, farming is always a community, uh, a community thing. And if you can imagine, Portsmouth agriculture was known up and down the East Coast and also as far south as the Caribbean. Uh, we traded our, our agriculture to go on ships down to the Caribbean. We also sent stuff down to the south. And if you can imagine, there was a, a train service that took uh, Portsmouth agriculture every week up to the hay market in Boston. So uh, no one around the world. Now, um, the farms here in Portsmouth have seen some hard times. Uh, during the Revolutionary War, the uh, British soldiers came and traipsed all the farms and uh, ravaged everything. And uh, of course, during certain hurricanes, the farms were knocked down. But uh, you can't keep the Portsmouth farmers down. They're always going to rise up and, and you know, grow again and become uh, what it is today. We also have some of the best farms um, here in New England in Portsmouth to this day. But um, seeds, um, if agriculture is a big business, how do you start it with seeds? So there was this gentleman named Henry Anthony, and he started with his seed business. This is some of his agricultural equipment here. And um, he was the largest grower of, of seeds in uh, of all of New England. And his seeds actually went uh, a lot to Boston as well. Produce was um, taken to Quaker Hill a lot and sold and then um, distributed to various areas. And uh, still to this day, farmers still truck their produce around um, various parts of New England. So uh, Portsmouth is still known for its agriculture here. But sadly, we don't have as many farms as we used to here in Portsmouth. Um, if you drive up and down the main road here, you're going to see things like um, Glen Farm, Sandy Point Farm, Oakland Farm, Sea Meadow Farm, Lawrence Farm. They don't exist anymore. We do have some really, really great farms here in Portsmouth, uh, you know, such as um, the Quonset View or the Escobars or the Sweetberry, but that's only a small percentage of what Portsmouth used to be known as. Well, the, um, I have to go back to milking the cows, and uh, she'll take you down to the next stop, but I thank everybody for coming today and um, seeing the agricultural display. This, um, this is a portrait of Mrs. Burke by Sarah J. Today this area is museum display space for the collection of the Portsmouth Historical Society. One very special item in our collection is the large, port the large portrait of a woman preparing vegetables for Thanksgiving dinner. We are about to meet Emmeline Eldridge. She was one of those suffragists that you hear about. She stepped into roles that up to then had been in the hands of men. She was superintendent of schools, trustee of the Portsmouth Free Public Library, and the director of the social studio. Emmeline was a social force in Portsmouth. Oh my, you make me blush. Well, you see that my um, history is well documented. But I want to tell you today about someone who is not so well remembered in Portsmouth history, but who was indeed a force. Her name was Sarah Eddy, and this is her picture. And this portrait, as you just heard, was painted by Sarah. This is a picture of my mother, my dear mother, Mrs. Elizabeth Burke, preparing a Thanksgiving feast. Now, if you look, you see that there are pies, bread, onions, cranberries. Can you tell me what is not in this picture? A bird. That's because Sarah Eddy was a vegetarian. Um, Sarah was a talented author, artist, photographer, painter, sculptor, animal lover, and she was the founder of the social studio. She has a home in Bristol Ferry. I'm sure if you've been down that way, you've noticed how beautiful the lighting is. Perfect 
for painting and photography. Sarah painted pictures of some people whose names you might remember. Frederick Douglass, sound familiar? Former slave, wrote a book, very well known lecturer in the area. She traveled up to Providence where he sat for her portrait. Susan B. Anthony, ever hear of her? Boats for women! Yes, indeed, Susan B. stayed for a while with Sarah and Sarah painted several pictures of her, a formal portrait you see here, and also a picture depicting Susan B. Anthony's 80th birthday celebration. Now at the celebration, 80 children presented Miss Anthony, each with a red rose. Now at the celebration, one of uh, Miss Anthony's nieces was in line. And when she came up and presented her with a rose, she expected her aunt to give her a hug and a kiss. So of course, Susan did, and then had to kiss every child that was behind her in line. <laughs> when Sarah painted the portrait, she used children who lived in the area to be the models. Sarah was an animal lover. In fact, as I told you, she was a vegetarian. Now there is a story that when Susan was staying with Sarah, a neighbor actually brought over some roast beef for dinner because there was no meat in Sarah's house. Sarah was so fond of all sorts of animals, especially cats, that she would let her lawn grow rather than take the chance of having it mowed down and killing a cricket or a mouse. She certainly lived her causes. Sarah would travel to schools around the area and distribute information on being kind to animals and how to care for them. She wrote several books. One of them was called Friends and Helpers, and one was called Alexander and Some Other Cats. And if you open to where I have the ribbons, you'll see some of the photographs that Sarah took of the children for the books. Sarah founded the social studio on Bristol Ferry Road, just near her house, in 1902. And for 27 years afterwards, children learned woodworking, crafts, sewing, painting, and music at this community arts center. Could you imagine, 1902, Portsmouth had a community arts center. Sarah would host a Christmas party at the center with the help of other ladies who lived in the area. And she would distribute gifts and fruit and candy. Why, some years, 250 children came to this holiday gala. Now that you know a little bit about Sarah Eddy, I hope that you will share her story with others.